Reproduction in living organisms ensures both continuity and change with favorable characteristics being passed from generation to generation. This happens through sexual or asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction requires two parents, with each contributing some of their genes to the offspring. This ensures that the offspring are genetically different from either of their parents. This advantage is important for organisms that live in environments that change over time, as promoting variation can result in new adaptations to the changed environment, allowing evolution via natural selection. Asexual reproduction requires only one parent, and all offspring are genetically identical to that parent. The advantage to this method is that it requires only one parent, so energy is not expended to find a mate. Asexual reproduction is usually faster and can create organisms to colonize a new area quickly. It produces offspring with little genetic variation, which is very efficient in an environment that is relatively unchanging. The production of haploid cells occurs by reduction division in meiosis. The number of chromosomes in each gamete is half of what is found in diploid cells. Diploid cells have chromosomes that exist in homologous pairs, a maternal chromosome and a paternal chromosome. Each new individual produced from sexual reproduction has a unique new combination of chromosomes. During the cell cycle in the S, or synthesis phase, DNA is replicated, producing a pair of chromatids from each chromosome. At the end of meiosis, each cell contains a random split of the chromosomes, which means each gamete has one chromosome from each of the homologous pairs. This is called haploid. For humans, our diploid number is 46, so our haploid number is 23. There are three ways genetic variation can occur. 1. Crossing over, which leads to recombination of alleles. This occurs during meiosis 1 during prophase 1. 2. Random orientation and division of chromosomes, which occurs during metaphase 1. This is sometimes called independent assortment of chromosomes. And 3. Random fertilization. There are millions of egg and sperm possibilities for just one set of parents. Fertilization occurs when gametes fuse to form a single cell. This restores the diploid number. Separating sexes into males and females for sexually reproducing organisms sheds light on how their reproductive structures operate. The primary difference is that male gametes travel to reach the female gametes, and this brings about differences in morphology between them, even though both are created via meiosis. Sperm are the male gametes and are motile due to the presence of a flagella. They are also much smaller than the egg. This increases the swimming efficiency of the sperm. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, the only thing the sperm contributes is the haploid nucleus. The egg, which is the female gamete, is much larger than the sperm and contains everything needed for embryonic growth. The egg provides all the organelles as well as all the nutrients the growing embryo needs. Humans typically release one egg during the menstrual cycle while some animals can produce large numbers. Human males produce millions of sperm, and a single ejaculation can contain millions of sperm in the fluid called semen. Of the millions of sperm that are ejaculated and begin swimming, only 100 to 200 will actually reach the egg, and then only one sperm will fertilize. The male and female reproductive systems are adapted for the production and release of gametes. The female also has adaptations to allow for fertilization of the egg in the environment conducive to the growing fetus. The female reproductive system includes the ovaries. The role of the ovaries is to produce and secrete estrogen, as well as produce and release eggs in the form of secondary oocytes. The ovary is also the place where ovulation occurs and the production of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum acts as a temporary gland producing estrogen. The fallopian tubes, also called the oviducts, are ducts that carry the egg from the ovary to the uterus. The uterus is a muscular organ where the embryo will implant and develop into a fetus. The lining of the uterus is called the endometrium, which is highly vascular. The lower part of the uterus is called the cervix, which has an opening for sperm to enter via the vagina and provides the exit for the baby. The vagina is a muscular tube that leads from the uterus to the outside. This is where semen is ejaculated and serves as the birth canal for the exit of the baby. Males have testes which are composed of small tubes called seminiferous tubules. It is in these tubules that sperm are produced. The epididymis sits on top of the testes and is the place where sperm go after production to mature and become capable of swimming. 
Both the testes and the epididymis are located externally in a sac called the scrotum. This is necessary as sperm production and maturation are unable to occur at body temperature. A muscular tube called the vas deferens carries the sperm from the epididymis to the urethra during ejaculation. The urethra is the tube that goes through the penis and out of the body. The penis is the organ that becomes erect as a result of blood engorgement and allows ejaculation. There are glands that produce fluid to the semen. The seminal vesicles produce seminal fluid, as does the prostate gland. The prostate gland sits at the base of the bladder, producing much of the seminal fluid as well as carbohydrates for the sperm. For the exam, you need to be able to label each of these structures and state their functions. The menstrual cycle begins in females during puberty. The cycle lasts approximately 28 days with the purpose of timing the release of an egg from the ovary, called ovulation, as well as implantation of the egg into the endometrium. The endometrium is highly vascular and if there is fertilization in pregnancy, the lining must be maintained to support the development of the placenta as well as the development of the fetus. If there is no pregnancy, the endometrium will break down and be passed out of the body. This is called menstrual flow. The hypothalamus is the control center for the menstrual cycle and produces a hormone called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, which targets the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then produces and releases two hormones, FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH, or luteinizing hormone. Both hormones target the ovaries and have several effects. One effect is to increase the production and secretion of estrogen from the follicle cells of the ovary. Estrogen targets the endometrium and causes it to increase the density of blood vessels. This is a positive feedback loop as estrogen stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more FSH and LH. The increase in FSH and LH cause the production of structures called graphene follicles. Within the ovary are structures called follicle cells and the reproductive cells, possible future eggs. They are in a state of development called oocytes. FSH and LH will cause these follicle cells and the oocyte to become graphene follicles. A spike in LH will cause ovulation. The oocyte is released along with the graphene follicles in a ring of follicle cells. This is what will enter the fallopian tube soon after ovulation. The outer ring of the graphene follicle will remain and begin to secrete progesterone. This outer ring also begins to divide and fill the wound left by the ovulation forming the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum produces progesterone for only 10 to 12 days after ovulation. If there is no fertilization, the corpus luteum will disintegrate, decreasing the production of progesterone and causing the endometrium to break down. If there is fertilization, the corpus luteum will continue to produce progesterone, which will maintain the lining of the endometrium, and there will be no menstrual flow. The high levels of both estrogen and progesterone will begin a negative feedback loop signal to the hypothalamus, inhibiting the production of gonadotrophin-releasing hormones. Without gonadotrophin-releasing hormones, FSH and LH are not produced. This will prevent the production of another graphene follicle. If there is no pregnancy, the corpus luteum will break down, leading to a decline in progesterone and estrogen, causing the endometrium to break down, menstruation occurs, and the cycle begins again. When progesterone and estrogen drop, gonadotrophin-releasing hormone is produced. We can divide the cycle into two components. The ovarian cycle controls the production and release of eggs and the cyclic release of estrogen and progesterone. The uterine cycle controls the preparation and maintenance of the lining of the uterus in order to receive a fertilized egg. It is critical that the timing of these two be synchronous. During sexual intercourse, millions of sperm are ejaculated and deposited into the vagina. The sugar in the semen is used by the sperm for energy to swim. The sperm must find the opening of the uterus, the cervical opening, and swim up endometrial lining to the fallopian tubes. If the woman has ovulated, there may be an egg in one of the fallopian tubes. Very few sperm actually reach the location of the egg, which is the reason for millions of sperm being ejaculated. Fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube, and no single sperm is able to accomplish the act of fertilization. It takes many sperm to penetrate the follicle cell layer, the zona pellucida, surrounding the egg. The zona pellucida is a gel composed of glycoproteins. Several sperm will release hydrolytic enzymes found in the acrosome at the tip of the sperm. Only one sperm will reach the plasma membranes first, and that is the sperm that will fertilize the egg. It is important to know that the sperm does not actually enter the egg. The membranes of the sperm and egg fuse, and the haploid nucleus of the sperm enters the egg. 
The egg produces vesicles to destroy the flagella and mitochondria of the sperm. The haploid nucleus of both the sperm and egg are now inside the egg, and chromosomes remain separate for a time, and membranes form around each. These are called a pronucleus. The DNA will undergo replication in preparation for mitosis. The two pronuclei come together and the temporary membranes dissolve. It takes about 30 hours after the fertilization for the first mitotic cell division to occur. By the end of day three, 16 cells will have formed. Infertility is the inability to conceive a child. There are many reasons for infertility, such as low sperm count in males, impotence, irregular ovulation, and obstructed fallopian tubes. Frequently, parents who have difficulty with having children may turn to a process called in vitro fertilization, or IVF. The female will undergo hormone therapy to suspend her natural menstrual cycle. Other hormones will then be given, including FSH, to stimulate the production of many graphene follicles. These eggs are removed surgically and fertilized externally. One to three healthy embryos are then introduced into the female uterus for implantation. Any embryos not used can be frozen for future use. While we have been discussing fertilization in humans, many plants also undergo sexual reproduction. The gametes of flowering plants can be found in the ovules, female structures, and pollen grains, the male structures. Meiosis gives rise to the ovules and pollen grains, while mitosis produces the actual gametes. Many species of flowering plants are hermaphrodites and have both male and female structures, which allows for self-pollination. The disadvantage to self-pollination is the loss of genetic diversity. Cross-pollination is the transfer of pollen from one plant to another, and there are many flower adaptations to facilitate this process. The petals of flowers have color, markings, and scents to attract specific pollinators. Pollen develops in anthers and are usually situated where pollinators can come into contact with them. When the pollinator travels to another plant, the pollen can be transferred to the female part, called the stigma. This is sticky and the pollen grains can adhere to it. The pollen that is stuck to the stigma will begin to grow into a structure called a pollen tube. One pollen tube carries two male nuclei and each results in fertilization. Plants undergo double fertilization. One fertilizes an ovule nucleus to create a zygote, and the other fertilizes the other two nuclei in the ovule to create the endosperm. Because of this, the endosperm is triploid with a chromosome number of 3N. This produces the endosperm, which is needed by the embryo for nutrition. There are many different pollinators, bees, birds, bats, insects, and some mammals. We will concentrate on flowers using insects, such as bees, wasps, butterflies, and moths. Flowers that attract insects usually have petals that are large and brightly colored. There is a strong scent to attract insects to their nectar at the base of the flower. The stamens are deep inside the flower so that when the insects drink the nectar, they brush against the stamen, picking up pollen. The pollen is sticky and may have spikes to help it stick to the legs of the insect. The stigma is also sticky, which helps hold the pollen. It is beneficial in plants to have variability, just as it is in animals. While many plants have both male and female reproductive structures, there are mechanisms that have evolved to promote cross-pollination. These include 1. Plates have different maturation times for ovules and pollen of the same flower. This ensures self-pollination cannot occur. 2. Some species have self-incompatibility mechanisms. The stigma and pollen may use chemicals that would not allow pollen tubes to grow. 3. Some species will produce flowers that only have the female parts, while others only have the male parts. And 4. Some species produce an entire plant that is either male or female and can only produce flowers of their own sex. And five, some species produce pollen that is only transferred by wind, which carries the pollen away from the parent plant. Self-pollination leads to inbreeding, which decreases genetic diversity and vigor. Many plants use the production of the pollen tube, which was discussed in a previous slide, as a mechanism to control self-pollination. There are a set of genes that control the production of the pollen tube, and when pollen lands on the stigma of the same plant, protein interactions will reduce or stop the growth of the pollen tube. This is a self-compatibility mechanism, and while these specific mechanisms may differ from species to species, the following can occur. 1. The pollen grain fails to germinate into a pollen tube. 2. The pollen grain may germinate but not enter through the stigma into the style. 3. The pollen tube enters the ovule, but the nuclei will degenerate before fertilization. And four, 
Fertilization occurs, but the embryo degenerates. The best pollination is cross-pollination, as it ensures genetic diversity and vigor resulting in the growth of a healthy plant. Once double fertilization has occurred, a seed will develop. If the flower has only one ovule, only one seed will develop. But if there are many ovules, many seeds will develop. The ovary will ripen and mature, becoming a fruit, and the number of seeds inside the fruit is an indication of how many ovules the ovary contains. The fruit is a means of dispersing the seed away from the parent plant. Many fruits have evolved to attract animals that may eat them, dispersing seeds. Some seeds are eaten and can be deposited in the animal's feces, which spreads them to a new location. Other forms of seed dispersal use wind and water as modes of travel. Once seeds are formed within the ovary, they become dormant. Dehydration occurs with the seeds losing much of their water content. During dormancy, there is no growth and very little metabolism. Seeds will germinate when the conditions are conducive for growth. Germination is the process of the seed beginning to develop into a plant. There are several conditions required for this to happen, including water to rehydrate the seed, oxygen for cellular respiration, and an appropriate temperature. The seed contains a plant embryo that uses the endosperm as a source of energy until it grows and develops leaves that are then used in photosynthesis. The endosperm tissues, which are the food reserves, are transferred to the developing embryo by the cotyledons. Imbibition is the process of the seed absorbing water, which begins the process of germination. Cellular respiration and protein synthesis increases as the embryo prepares to emerge from the seed. The radical is the first to emerge and is the initial root structure. It demonstrates a positive influence by gravity growing downward into the soil. The hypocotyl is the first structure to emerge above ground and is below the cotyledons. The hypocotyl grows upward opposite the force of gravity. The first real leaves will then develop and photosynthesis will begin. The endosperm is depleted. The root structures continue to develop forming a secondary root and root hairs. From this point forward, the growth of the plant will be from the meristemic tissues found at tips of roots and shoots.